everyone to National Astronomy Week. You may be here with us on Zoom, which is brilliant. You may be watching us on YouTube. Uh, this is a week devoted to how we can encounter Mars because it's really close to us as a planet, close to planet Earth at the moment. Um, so it's something we can all see in the night sky. Uh, have a look behind me though. Let me have a, have a quick look. It's not quite that close. Okay, so when you go outside tonight, it's not actually going to look that close, but it does look like a bright orangey sky, a starry like object in the night sky. So maybe, maybe if it stops raining at the weekend, you can go out tonight and have a look at the stars. My name is Sharon, and I work with science centers and planetarium domes across the UK. I wonder if anyone here has been inside a planetarium where you can see stars and planets during the daytime? Well, Someone who also knows loads about stars and space is my friend Sheila. Uh, she's also on the screen. Hi, Sheila. Hello. Good morning. I, I hope it's uh, going to be clear tonight so we can have a look at Mars. Where I am right now, it doesn't look very hopeful, but there we go. Anyway, there will be remote observing uh, this evening as well if the weather is bad where you are. So my name's Sheila. I work at the Royal Astronomical Society and uh, Sharon and I will be your hosts today. Um, we've got a great session lined up. We've got two fantastic um, organisations presenting on Tales of Mars. And then we will have a question and answer session at the end. So do type your questions into the Q&A boxes and we will get to them at the end. OK, so the first thing I would like to do is introduce Rhiannon from the Lightyear Foundation. The Lightyear Foundation is a charity that breaks down barriers to disabled children accessing science, technology, engineering and maths. Rhiannon manages and delivers the active learning classes, as well as other projects such as the Role Model Scheme and the Work Inspiration Trip. Lightyear Foundation recently partnered with Flamingo Chicks to create a unique fusion of science and dance, which brings the science, technology, engineering and math subjects to life in a sensory and inclusive way for young people with SEND to enjoy. So passing on to Rihanna now. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Alien Worlds dance class. So this session is an active learning session, which means we will be getting active, getting moving and dancing whilst learning. You will, so if you're in a school or in a classroom, you might like to move some chairs out of the way. So you've got lots of space to dance in today. You will see me very soon in a video. And I hope that you can join in with everything that I am doing with the dancing and the movement. So bring lots of energy and follow me through the video. And I will see you very soon at the end. Have fun and I'll see you soon. Hello and welcome to Flamingo Chicks. Today, we are going to learn about science by dancing. Let's get ready to begin. We're going to start with our Flamingo Chicks welcome circle. Everyone gather round. It's time to transform into flamingos. One, two, three. Join in and show me your flamingo. Does it stand up tall? Or does it use its eyes to grow big or small? Maybe it spreads its wings and stretches out wide. Or does it use its feelers like feathers to hide? Does it stand on one leg? Or use its head to move? I want to see your flamingo get ready to groom. Now where are we going on our journey today? It's time to find out so we can get on our way. Help me make some magic to reveal the theme. Let's wiggle and wriggle and point at the screen. Three, two, one. Aliens! Today we are exploring alien worlds. There is so much out there in space that we don't know about yet. So I think it's time to explore. Let's begin on Mars. Let's march together as we explore Mars. You can march like this, or with your head, 
or with your shoulders. Any way you like, let's go. Now, there are space organisations like the European Space Agency who would like to know more about Mars. And so they're sending a robot called the ExoMars Rover to investigate. Look, there it is. Let's become robots. Show me how you move as a robot. Think about straight lines, very straight and stiff. Very good. Maybe your head moves as a robot or your legs. Any moves you like to be a robot. Fantastic. We've got to be very straight and stiff. Nothing floppy, straight and stiff because robots are made of very durable materials like metals. Very cool robot moves everyone. Let's practice a robot wave. It goes like this. Up, twist and side to side. Can you try that with me? Keep that arm nice and stiff. Here we go. Up, twist and side to side. Wave like a robot with me. Very good. We could use our head up and side to side. Very stiff movements together. Up, twist and side to side. Maybe use your head as well. Very good robot waves, everyone. If you'd like a challenge, you could try and move your robot arms in opposite directions. Look at those robot waves. Good job. Side to side or opposite directions. Fantastic. Now, one thing that the ExoMars rover is doing on Mars is looking for signs of life like water or ice. And to do that, it uses its very special drill. Let's have a go at becoming the rover's drill. We need to press with our foot, press very hard. Use the ball of your foot to press into the ground like the drill on the ExoMars rover that's drilling into the surface of Mars to find out what's underneath. Push really hard. You can test if you're pushing really hard by balancing all your weight on that leg. See if you can balance and it shows you if you're using all your weight on the front of your foot near your toes, the ball of your foot. Good job. We can press with our hands as well. Both sides press or our fingers. If you're sat down, you can press your hand onto your leg. Good job, pressing down like the ExoMars Rover drill. But it also twists whilst it presses. So let's try that. We're gonna press our foot and then we're gonna twist it like a drill. Can you see that twisting action? Very good, we're still putting the weight on the front of our foot or our hand and twisting round and round as if we're drilling down. Let's try it on this side. Twist it, very good. The ExoMars rover can drill up to two meters below the surface of Mars. I wonder what it will find. Bring your robot arms into the twist if you like everyone and twist like this or use your finger. Very good, or someone can do this action on part of your body to help feel that twist. Fantastic. Let's see if we can take the twist into our robot bodies. Turn your robot arms so they're facing down, like they're pressing, and see if you can twist from the middle. Very good. Imagine we are the drill investigating below the surface on Mars. What do you think we could find? Twist like this. Good job. Fantastic everyone, well done. Now, I think it's time for this ExoMars rover to get moving, but we can only move in a square because a square has straight lines like our robot moves. So we can move like this, join in with me. We can go forward, and forward, and side, and 
side, very good. Backwards and backwards. So we're moving on a grid, everyone, in the shape of a square. This time, I might like to add some head movements or some arm movements with my robot. You could do any of these or just some of them or all of them together. Join in, here we go. Forward and forward, side and side, very good. Backwards and backwards and again, forwards and forwards, side and side, backwards and backwards, very good. Great grids everyone. But what if our robots want to move up and down? Let's try that. We can go down by bending our knees like this, but instead of being soft like we've done before, try and keep that bend very quick and sudden. So we're moving like a robot. Good job. We could do this with our hands, bending quick and sharp movements. And if we want to go up as a robot, we could do a rise, pushing up onto the balls of our feet and lowering up and down, up and down, or with our shoulders up and down, up and down, our heads up and down. However you'd like to rise and lower is how you can do it. I'm going to add some arms in as well. Join in if you like. Here we go. We're going to make our robots go bend down and up, rise up and down, bend down and up, rise up and down, bend down and up, rise up and down, last one, down and up, rise up and down. Great job everyone, give yourselves a robot clap. It's time to investigate more of Mars, follow me. Now, you will tell me if you see anything funny, won't you? There might be aliens, who knows? Keep a lookout. Let's go! Wow! There's so much to see. Now keep a, keep a lookout because we don't know what we're going to find. What's that? You can see something! Where? Behind, behind me? You're right! Look! It looks like a footprint. Maybe it's alien footprints, everyone. Now, what kind of alien do you think that is? Join in with me. Maybe it's a tall alien or a small alien. Maybe it's a wide alien or a narrow alien. Maybe it's a light and gentle alien or a stomping, heavy alien. Maybe it's a loud alien. Or a quiet alien. Shh. What kind of alien would you like to be? Let's find out. We're going to do a wiggly alien dance. And when I say freeze, I want to see your alien position. It might be a sheep. A position, a stretch, a balance, anything you like, show me your alien. Maybe use your face. Is it a funny alien? A happy alien? A sad alien? Or a shocked alien? Anything you like. Join in the rhythm with me. Here we go. Wiggle like an alien. Wiggle like an alien and freeze and freeze. Very good. Again, wiggle like an alien. Wiggle like an alien and freeze and freeze. Very good. Those aliens were amazing, everyone. Wait, what, what can you hear? What's that sound? Wow. I can see some aliens. I can't believe we've found aliens. Now, I don't know how to speak alien language, so let's do a wonderful dance to communicate with them. 
some of the moves you've done before and others will be new, so copy me. And we'll finish with a freestyle where you can do your own alien moves. Are you ready? Here we go. Wiggle like an alien, wiggle like an alien and freeze, and freeze. Wiggle like an alien, wiggle like an alien and freeze, and freeze. Very good. And hop from side to side. Very good. We're being bouncy aliens today. Or step from side to side. Very good. Use your head from side to side. Any way you like. From side to side. Side to side. Fantastic. Good job. Are you ready to swing? Swing around, swing around, stretch out wide and bend those knees. Big alien moves together. Great job. Keep going. Very good. Well done. And now it's time for your freestyle. How does your alien move around the room that you're in? Does it roll? Does it run? Does it jump or hop? Anything you like. I'm going to count to eight. Show me how your alien moves around the room. Travel like an alien. How do you move? Travel like an alien. How do you move? Again, travel like an alien. How do you move? Travel like an alien. How do you move? Oh, fantastic everyone. Give yourselves a big round of applause. Good job. I think the aliens liked that. Let's wave goodbye. To finish our class, we're going to enjoy a nice relaxing cool down. We're going to start with our ballet fingers. We're going to match our thumb with our first finger. Looks a bit like a bird's mouth. And we're going to take those ballet fingers into some circles of our wrist. Very good. You can relax your thumb and your finger if you prefer and enjoy those circles. And we're going to take the circles into our shoulders, relaxing them down as we circle them backwards. And change direction and circle them forwards. Lovely. Good job, everyone. Let's bring the circle into our head. Relax it as we move it around very gently and very slowly. Enjoy that stretch and the other way. Lovely, good job, where we go. And we're going to take that circle action into a big stretch with our arms. We're going to bring our arms over the top, stretch all the way around and relax back down over to the side, stretching up and over. This time we're going, to, we're going to pause on this diagonal stretch and really enjoy that stretch down the side of your body. Breathe into all the space in your ribs and give it a bit of a rub or someone can help you. Enjoy that stretch and bring it back round. That feels lovely. And the other side, pause on that diagonal stretch. Breathe into that space that's been created in your ribs and give it a rub. Someone can help. And back round and relax. Good job, everyone. Now we're going to think about making our bodies really tall. We can do this by stretching with our arms all the way up and then gently floating our arms down like wings. Lovely. Or we could do this with our shoulders stretching them up and floating them down with little bounces. Our head and neck, we could stretch all the way up high and then gently nod as we lower back down to normal. One more all together, everyone. However you'd like to make yourself tall, enjoy that stretch and then float down. Very nice, good job. We're going to finish by making the flamingo chick's petals appear. Now to do this, we need to make our bodies very, very small and then very big. 
Let's start by bringing everything in small and squeezing tight. Squeeze your legs, your arms. Someone can help by squeezing you if you like. And squeeze your faces and see if you can count to three with me before growing big to make the petals appear. Are you ready? Here we go. One, two, three, grow big. <gasps> wow, beautiful, we did it. Good job, everyone. Let's try it again. Make yourself small, squeeze very tight. Count to three with me, here we go. One, two, three, grow big. <gasps> beautiful, <sighs> fantastic, everyone. Thank you for joining us and dancing today. There's more to explore if this made you say, hooray! We've got science experiments and arts and crafts for you to try. You could send us your pictures. We would love to say hi. See you next time. Wow, that was absolutely fantastic. I hope you were following it along as I was, wiggling like an alien and doing your robot arms. I had a lot of fun. I'm absolutely exhausted now. Um, so I would like to introduce our next um, next event. Um, this is coming from Ben and the Explorer Dome team. So Ben is a founding director and senior presenter with the Explorer Dome. From its early days in the 1990s, it's touring schools with a mobile planetarium Explorer Dome is now one of the UK's leading science outreach organisations and has bases in Bristol, Birmingham and London. Explorer Dome delivers a wide range of presenter-led science shows to schools, youth groups, festivals and events across the UK, reaching 74,000 people last year and keeping science hands-on interactive and fun. So before I introduce Ben, don't forget we are taking question and answers at the end of Ben's session, so do keep typing your questions in the Q&A box. Over to Ben. Good morning, everyone. Hello. So yeah, my name is Ben, and I'm coming to you from Bristol. Some of you might be in Bristol, some of you might be in London, some of you might be all over the country. So uh, really nice to see you all here. And first of all, I want to say a big thank you to Rhiannon because that was lovely. I hope you're all doing your, your robot moves and your uh, awesome alien faces. I certainly was, but I'm here to talk all about space. And the first thing I want to ask you, and I'm gonna give you 10 seconds just to call out with as many things as you can that you would find in space. What's in space? Go! You're allowed to call out. What would you get in space? What sort of things? There are loads of things in space. Of course, there are stars and planets, there are comets, there are spaceships, there are satellites, there are meteors, there's the moon, there's the sun, but my favourite thing in space, and I'll give you a clue, we can see hundreds of them, thousands of them. There are millions of stars. The stars are beautiful. Of course, we can't visit the stars, they're too far away. But we could go to the moon. Who would like to be an astronaut? Go on, who would like to go to the moon? Or let's go to another planet, the red planet, Mars. That's where we want to send people. There are giant planets, Jupiter. Does anyone know a planet with rings? Huge, big rings. What's this? Saturn. But we're going to travel beyond the planets. We're going to travel past cold, dark, distant, icy objects. We're far away from the sun now. We're going to explore the galaxy find strange, mysterious and beautiful things. Clouds. There are clouds in space. They've got a proper name. They're called nebulae. Can everyone say nebulae? <laughs> nebulae. Some are beautiful. Some look a bit like a butterfly. I think this one looks a bit like a butterfly. There's one that some say looks like a witch's head. She's looking this way. Can anyone see a spooky witch's head? 
and one of the best. This looks like a weird alien eye, but these are all real. And in real life, this is an old star. When stars get old, they can go and the leftover gas makes these beautiful clouds up in space. Well, there are loads of things in space and I'm sure you've mentioned lots of things in space, but don't forget we're in space. I mean, we live on a planet, don't we? What's our planet called? Planet Earth. This is our home, our world. It's a beautiful planet. It's the only planet where we know things can live. We've not found aliens on other worlds, not yet. Earth has beautiful blue oceans. You can probably see the white fluffy clouds up in the sky, but of course, we're above the sky now. We're looking down from space. You might see green. What's the green stuff on planet Earth? Could there be jungles? We can see lush tropical rainforests. Perhaps you can see some orange, the dry, dusty deserts. And you might notice that there's a daytime side, but there's a nighttime side. See, the sun shines on Earth, and when the sun's shining, it's daytime. Can anyone see little lights on the nighttime side? Those lights show us where people live, perhaps where there are cities, street lights or house lights. But I want to have a look at our neighbour, Earth's neighbour, our nearest neighbour. You all know because you've all seen it. It's big and bright. We can see it in the day, but more often at night. The moon. Some used to say it's made of cheese. Is it made of cheese? No. It's a huge rock in space. Sometimes it seems to change shape from a half moon to a little banana shaped crescent moon. So the moon has day and night as well. But my favorite moon is when the sun shines on the full face of the moon. And we see a full moon. So the moon is our neighbor and the moon is moving. Everything in space is moving and we can see just how it moves. The moon goes around the world. Here it is. Now we've made things faster. You might be able to see the earth spinning round and round and round. Every day and night the world spins around. The moon orbits the earth. That means the moon is going around our planet and that takes about a month. That's where the word moon comes from. It's an old word meaning to measure. So perhaps the moon helps us measure time. But the earth orbits as well. The earth is moving. Our planet is going around the sun. The sun is our nearest star, a huge ball of exploding gas. And earth isn't the only planet. These circles, show you the orbits of all eight planets in our solar system. On the edge, we've got Neptune. Moving in, we'll find Uranus, Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, Earth, Venus, and then little Mercury, the closest planet to the sun. But there's a planet I would love to visit. It's a planet we want to send humans to in the future. Humans have never been there. We've sent robots, but we've never sent people. I want to go to the red planet. And what's the red planet called? Mars. I would love to travel through space and land on Mars. Well, there is a spaceship on its way to Mars right now. It doesn't have people. It does have a robot and it's going to land in a crater, this circle is a crater, it's got a lovely name. It's called Jezero Crater, Jezero. So that's the name of the place on Mars where it's going to land. And when it does, it's got a very important job to do. People sometimes ask, could there be living things on Mars? Could there be aliens? on Mars. Well, we don't know. We've not found any yet. The rover, the big rover, 
is going to explore for signs of ancient life. But even more exciting, I think, is a little helicopter. It's got a great name. It's called Ingenuity. And we've never, never flown a helicopter on Mars before. Now this hasn't landed yet. It's going to land next year in February. So we've got a few months to wait, but it's gonna to test to see, can we fly on another planet? Can we fly this little drone around? It won't be crawling slowly like a robot rover. It'll be able to fly fast. It'll be able to fly over this huge area. This net shows us the, the area that the drone's going to fly. And who knows what it will be able to find. Somebody asked earlier, can robots go up gradients? Well, they can go up gentle gradients. If you want to go up a gentle hill, the rover can do it, but a rover can't climb a cliff. But this drone can, this helicopter, can certainly go down steep craters and explore places we've never been before. So wait until next year, wait until February for Perseverance, the rover, and Ingenuity, the helicopter. That's gonna be exciting. But you know what? Although we've not been to Mars, we have sent people to the moon 50 years ago. Human beings like Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, Michael Collins wasn't far away. They went to the moon. And I've got my own moon right here. Now, the next time you see a full moon, I would like to tell you a story about the moon. You see, 3000 years ago, People didn't know the moon was a big rock up in space. In the old days, the ancient Greeks believed the moon was a lady, a beautiful lady, the goddess of the moon, the goddess of the night and the goddess of the hunt. You see, in the old days, you couldn't just go to the shop and buy meat. Somebody would have to catch an animal and it was the job of the hunters. They would often go out at night to catch animals in the moon would look down from the sky and the moon would look after them. But one night, the moon looked down and she saw a hunter she'd never seen before. And this was no ordinary hunter. This man was like a giant. He had great big strong muscles and a big silver sword and a shield. And his name was Orion. Orion the hunter. Orion is famous, you might have heard of him. Orion is famous for his belt because in his belt, he kept diamonds, not just one, not just two, three beautiful diamonds. One, two, three. And there they were in his belt for all to see. So he had a sword, he had a shield, he had three diamonds in his belt and he had a pet dog, a hunting dog. And his dog had a lovely name. His dog was called Sirius. What was his dog called? Sirius, just checking. What did Orion have in his belt? Three beautiful diamonds, just checking. Now, the moon. The moon looked down from the sky. The moon saw Orion. She saw his big muscles. She saw his diamonds and she saw Sirius the dog. And the moon did something a little bit silly. She fell in love. The moon fell in love with Orion. Cooey, she said, Orion, I love you. The moon fell madly in love with Orion. But Orion was too busy being a hunter with his sword and his shield and his pet dog called Sirius. Very good. Orion said something he should never have said. Orion said something terrible. Orion said, tonight I am going to kill all the animals. Now that's not a good thing to say. Orion must be stopped. And there was an animal that stopped him, but it wasn't a big, fierce animal. It was a little tiny animal with lots of legs and a sting. Now I'm gonna give you 10 seconds. I want you to call out, what do you think it could have been? What was it? What sort of animal is very small, has lots of legs and a sting? It could have been a bee, could have been a wasp, could have been an ant, a spider, a centipede. I'm not going to tell you what it was, but I'll tell you what happened. This little animal crept up. It crept up to Orion's shoulder. And when it got to his shoulder, 
it gave Orion a sting, a sting so powerful that Orion, this mighty hunter, fell down dead. Now the animals were saved. The animals were happy, but don't forget the moon. The moon loved Orion. And when she saw that Orion had died, she was so sad she did something amazing. She picked up Orion by those three diamonds in his belt. She lifted him higher and she put him in the sky to be with her forever. And in a way, he's still there, although he's not a real man. Something's changed. What would you see in the sky that looks like diamonds? Stars. Those three diamonds were said to have turned into three stars, the stars of Orion's belt. His head turned to stars, his shoulders, his whole body turned to stars. And what was his dog called? Sirius was turned into the brightest of all the stars. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is where we're going next. We're going to the stars. As the sun sets, and the stars begin to come out. Have a look for three stars together. Can anybody see three stars in a row? Have a good look. These are stars we see in the winter time. And perhaps you found them. Can anyone see three stars together? three stars in a straight line. There it is. Now, people say you can draw a dot to dot picture in the stars. And this is something we're going to try and do. I bet you've done dot to dot pictures. Well, I've got a friend called Josh, who's in the same room as me. And on the computer, he is going to try and draw a little picture. So this is a brave moment for art. It's a brave moment for Josh. But Josh, can you imagine a little belt? those three stars forming his belt. Ah, well, maybe you can do it. Josh can't do it at the moment, but maybe you can. Maybe somebody can come up to the screen and try to draw three stars in a belt. Maybe there are some shoulders or some legs, a head. We can make it a little bit easier for you because the ancient Greeks saw him looking like this. Look at that, we've drawn a dot to dot picture in the stars. It's called a constellation. Can you all say constellation? If you draw a picture in the stars, it's a constellation. There's Sirius. So Orion and Sirius really are in the stars. And we're going to play a game. And you can all join. Everyone can join in on this game. Okay, you're going to have to make some noise. All right. So uh, teachers, this is okay because I want to hear this. Right, I'm in Bristol and if you're far away you're going to have to make this loud. I'm going to show you a picture of the stars. Don't tell me what it is. I want you to make the noise the animal would make. First things first, what sort of noise would Sirius make? Come on, I want to hear a woof 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 Very good. Okay, what about a little puppy dog? What about a small dog? <laughs> what about a great big snake? A sea serpent called Hydra. What about a great big bull? A cow? <laughs> Very good, yeah, well done, well done. Oh, a rabbit. What sort of noise would a little rabbit make? What about a snippy snappy crab? Okay, and what about a unicorn? <laughs> a mythical noise for a mythical creature. And the biggest one, the loudest one, what sort of noise would a lion make? <laughs> oh, not too scary. These are all of the constellations. And we've not yet seen which animal killed Orion. I said Orion was stung by an animal, but to find out what it was, we need to take a journey through the stars. As our planet spins around, the stars seem to move. Every day and night, 
Earth spins and we see different constellations. As the Earth goes around the Sun, we see different ones. And there's the scorpion. Can anyone see a scorpion? With nippy claws, eight legs, a long looping tail with a sting at the end. It was the scorpion that stung Orion. So it went into the stars as well. But I would like to finish in a minute by looking at the stars you'll see tonight. You see, tonight, if you go out, three of the brighter stars actually form a big triangle. One, two, three. And people thought it was like the eye of an eagle, a harp and a swan flying through the sky. But the nice thing about finding the triangle, and oddly, although it's called the summer triangle, we see it throughout the autumn. So you'll certainly see it tonight and for the rest of the month. But it points down to two bright things. Now, look, can you see two bright stars? Okay, they look like two bright stars, but they're not. One of them is the giant planet Jupiter. You can see Jupiter tonight. It looks like a really bright star. And there's one next to it, which I bet you'll know. If you know the name, I want you to call out. It's a famous planet. It's got rings. Saturn! Of course it is. But the most important job I have for you tonight and you might have worked out that we've been talking a lot about Mars. Well, you can see Mars. And the special thing about this year, 2020, is Mars is brighter, brighter in the sky, brighter even than Jupiter. It's the brightest it will be for the next 15 years. So make the most of it. Get out there. I think it might be raining tonight, certainly for me in Bristol. But tomorrow night is meant to be a little bit clearer. So I'm certainly going to go out. Have a look for Mars. Can I just say, it's been a real pleasure talking to you all. Good luck seeing Mars. Good luck seeing the stars. And that is the end of my little session. Thank you very much. That was great. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much to Ben at Explorer Dome and the team there, and of course, Rhiannon as well. In fact, now we've got time. We've got questions pouring in. Remember, if you um, want to ask a question, just go down to the bottom of your screen in the middle and there's those two little speech bubbles and just type a question in if you can. Um, whilst we start with some of the ones that have already been coming in. So at this point, I am going to need Ben and Rhiannon back on the screen. So there is nowhere to hide. So it's all for Hello. us. Hello. Hi. Welcome back. So we have got loads of questions about Mars, about space, uh, which have been brilliant. And one of the first questions that came up was this. I wonder how Mars lost its atmosphere. Who can answer that? Go for it, Ben. <laughs> well, I can give it a go. So Mars, did, Mars does have some air, but it's very, very thin air. It's 100 times thinner than our air. So you certainly couldn't breathe on Mars and that's going to make it difficult for my little helicopter to fly on Mars. So if Mars had a thicker atmosphere, we think Mars used to be a magnet, like a magnet. I'm sure some of you have played with magnets. Our planet Earth is still a magnetic, we have a magnetic field, so we act like a magnet. But Mars seems to have lost its magnetic field and that meant it wouldn't be able to hold on to its air. So we think a long time ago, billions of years ago, the magnetic field became much, much weaker, so weak that all the air on Mars would have been lost into space. Interesting. Do you have any questions you'd like to bring, Sheila? Well, I could add to that. Um, so it, is it the other thing, like, like um, Ben said about the, the thin atmosphere and the fact that Mars isn't a magnet, the sun is um, always spewing this high energy stuff into space called the solar wind. And it's a bit like a big tidal wave of stuff coming towards us. And the earth is a magnet and is protected by its magnetic field. And the solar wind does flow over us, but it doesn't strip away our atmosphere. But um, because Mars is no longer a, a, a magnet or not in the same way that the earth is, the solar wind just blew it all away. So um, it, we, we can see the effects of the solar wind. If you've ever managed to get up to the North Pole or the South Pole, we can see Aurora, um, Australis or Borealis at the, the South and North. And that's the solar wind actually interacting with our atmosphere, which is very cool. 
Okay, uh, next question. Um, this is from Cameron and Grace. Do we think aliens live on Mars? Who wants to go? Anyone? I don't mind. I'd be interested to ask Rhiannon or I mean anyone, because at the moment, we don't know. So it'd be interesting to ask you what you think. I mean, I suppose we can look at Mars. We've sent robots to Mars and we've not found any living things on Mars at the moment. So if you were to ask me, are there aliens on Mars now? I would say probably not. But we know that Mars was much wetter. Mars did have liquid water. Uh, there is still water, certainly beneath the surface. Uh, so, it, I mean, it's possible there could be simple living things like little germs, little bacteria, microorganisms. It's possible they could be on Mars right now, alive and well, kind of deep within the soil. Uh, and that's that's one of the jobs that these rovers, so the the ExoMars rover that Rhiannon showed you and the um, the Perseverance rover that I showed you, um, they're they're trying to drill down to have a look and see if there are signs of life. So it's it's possible, it's possible. I would agree with Ben. Yeah, we we just don't know what is out there in space, and whilst we're investigating Mars, there's so much out there that we haven't investigated yet. So. I quite like to think that maybe there might be something out there that we don't know about because my imagination quite likes to imagine all the aliens that are out there and, and to see what we might discover one day. So for the purpose of my imagination and my enjoyment of dancing with aliens, I'm going to say, yes, I think there might be something out there. And, and maybe if there isn't something out there now, maybe it used to have aliens and it just doesn't anymore. Another thing to think about. I think we've got a, an audio question next. Um, we yes, we do. Um, this is from Zainab, who's been answering some great questions. I just wanted to say, Ben, his guesses were a spider bee and a bumblebee of the animals who might have uh, killed mm. Ryan. So that's quite cool, isn't it? Um, so what we're going to try and do is we're going to try and unmute uh, Zainab because he has answered quite a few of your questions um, to see if he's able to ask his question directly to you. So, Zainab, can you speak? Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. That's perfect. Can are, are robots safe with animals or creatures in Mars? Great when... question. So, you know, what happens? Are they safe if they, we're sending these robots to another planet? And, uh, and, and are the robots safe for those animals and creatures? Zainab, thank you. I think that's a, that's a brilliant question. So I suppose if let's imagine that there are living things on Mars, um, I suppose you might imagine, well, is the robot going to squish them all? <laughs> and that's that's one thing. But actually, scientists have to take this very, very seriously because, you know, sometimes we might get germs and we might get a cold or we might get the flu. Um, and what if that happened on Mars? What if there are living things on Mars? And if um, if the rovers that we send to Mars, if they had some microbes from Earth, could we give alien things on Mars? Could we give them a disease? You know, could we accidentally wipe out all the aliens before we've even discovered them? Um, and that, that's a really important point. Um, so yes, so when we send spaceships um, to other planets, uh, we're very, very careful that they don't have any germs on them. It's a bit like us washing our hands all the time. When we send a spaceship up, we make sure it's at a thorough wash uh, so there are no germs. We say that they're sterile before they go into space because we don't want to hurt. Um, aliens if they are there. And they're also, the ExoMars rover is very, very slow. So it only moves at three miles per hour on Mars. So that's something to remember as well. They're not whizzing around and breaking things and banging things. They're very, very well controlled pieces of technology. So that's three miles per hour that the ExoMars travels on the surface of Mars. I'm just imagining all these little aliens watching the spaceships come down and then like running around as the, as the rover's going along at three miles an hour, all the aliens <laughs> kind of scuttling out of the way. It'd be, it'd be great. It's a really interesting question because when you work on planetary missions, you have to adhere to something called the Planetary Protection Act. So whenever you make satellites that are going to land on other places or even orbit around other places that could potentially have life on them, you have to make sure that they are super clean before they go up into space, just in case there is something on another planet or a moon. And, and like you said, you don't want to crash in, crash into it and squash any aliens or anything like that. So check out the Planetary Protection Act. That's something to think about. I'm hoping that that did answer your question. Yes. 
Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much. And thank you for asking that live as well. That's pretty brave. Um, I've got some questions here from Mrs. Gladman's class. Um, they are asking, how old is Mars and how hot is it? So Mars is 4.5 billion. I had to do a lot of noughts there for my signing. Billion, that's nine noughts. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 4.5 billion years old. So it's very, very old, Mars. 4.5 billion. That's a lot of birthday candles to blow out, isn't it? 4.5 billion years old. That is brilliant. And does anyone know how hot it is? It looks really hot. Seeing it's that, weird. It, it looks, it looks, looks really, really like hot. Red. <laughs> yeah. People often, people often imagine that Mars is going to be hot because it looks, um, it looks red. But really, the red colour comes from the soil. The, the Earth on Mars is rich in iron. And if you've got something metal, you know, it can go rusty. Um, and so it's rust, really. It's got iron oxide. It's that sort of reddish brown colour. So in reality, Mars is cold, freezing cold. Um, so normally it's around minus 40, minus 60, but it can get as cold as minus 100. So if you go to Mars, wrap up warm. Yeah, I always thought that Mars was the hot planet just because of the red colour. It just makes you think it must be really hot. But it always surprises me how cold it can get on Mars. We, we've got loads and loads of questions. If you do want to answer your, ask your question with your sound on, in the, in the participants box, you can put your hand up and then we can unmute you and you can answer your question. You can ask your question with your voice instead of um, the chat. Um, but for now, uh, next question from James and Becky. Why does the moon look bright in the sky at night time? Oh, right. <laughs> well, only because I've got a nice little moon here. Um, the moon looks bright because the sun shines on the moon. So the moon is like a mirror reflecting the sunlight. Um, and that's why it seems to change shape, because depending on where the moon is and where the sun is, if the sun's over on the other side, we might only see a half moon or we might only see a crescent moon. I mean, the moon is always round, but it seems bright uh, because the sun's shining on it. Weirdly, I'm told the moon isn't actually that shiny. It's not that bright. Um, apparently, it's the same colour as a road. So, you know, a road, like tarmac, might be more a sort of dark grey or black. Apparently, that's what colour the moon really is. But to us, it looks beautiful and bright and shiny. Thank you so much. We've got some hands up. So people who actually have microphones, I realise that you've got so many questions and some of you don't have microphones. So we, we can bring your questions uh, to the group. But um, for some of you who do have microphones, I know Miss Pierce uh, and her class have got uh, some mm. questions they'd like to ask. So we'll just wait for you to be unmuted, Miss Pierce. Can you speak? Yes, we're here. Thank you. Erin's um, got a brilliant question she'd love to ask. How much gravity is on Mars? Ooh, how much gravity is on Mars? Oh, anyone know? Hmm, there's less gravity. I know that. <laughs> Let, I've got I've got a little elf who's helping me. Josh, have you got an actual answer? <laughs> He's coming up with broke it. our chins going, hmm. So it's a very good question because we've all gone, hmm. It's um, lower. So the gravity on the Earth, we measure it to be about nine. If 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 we're picking if we're picking numbers, we'd pick the number nine uh, meters per second squared. And the gravity on Mars is more like three. So if ours, we feel our gravity. At, at nine, um, the, the gravity on Mars is around three, so it's about a third, a third of the gravity on the Earth. So it's a lot less. It's a lot less than it is on the Earth. Um, not as not as low as it would be on the Moon, though. So those videos you might have seen of astronauts bouncing about on the Moon, it would be a bit like that, but not quite the same as that. I love it. I want to bounce around on Mars. Did you know they think the next, the person who will be the next woman or man on Mars is probably in primary school right now? So maybe you guys, one of you guys will get to bounce around on Mars, who knows? Um, let's see if we can go to the year five from Leslie Silverman's class. Um, let's see if you're yes. unmuted to answer your questions. Hello. 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 Yes. Say hello year five. Yeah. Hello. 
right, Jack, do you want to come and ask your question? Yeah. There we are, Jack's coming to ask. Here we are. Um, when, when, there we are, it's written down there. <laughs> so easy to forget, I do that all the time. <laughs> How the Mars drone will be deployed and controlled. Ooh. Great question. Good question. So I, I can start giving you some a little bit of information about the ExoMars rover. So the ExoMars rover is happening in two parts. The first part has already happened. That happened in 2016. They sent the Trace Gas Orbiter to begin the mission. That was, so it, it launched in 2016 in, in the beginning of the year and it landed in October 2016. And the second part of the ExoMars rover, the actual rover that we saw in the video, that is launch, going to be launched in 2022. So we've got a little bit of a wait to get there, but it should be launched in 2022 and then land on Mars in 2023. So it's a mission that happens in different stages. Um, and so that's, that's the details for the ExoMars rover, but maybe Ben can tell us more about the one that's happening next year, because that's a little bit sooner. Next, next February, when the uh, when the Perseverance lander goes to Mars, so it's on it's on its way now. It launched back in July. It launched in the summer holidays, uh, and it'll land next February. And the drone, so the Ingenuity drone, is kind of piggybacking. I think it's in the tummy of the rover at the moment. So the rover will land, um, and then they will be able to deploy. And the deployment of the drone will be controlled from Earth. But because there's a bit of a time delay it's very difficult to actually fly the drone from Earth. So one of the one of the big tests about this drone is it's going to have to fly itself. So it's going to have to be autonomous and do it by itself. So it's going to have to work out um, when it moves around where it's safe to go and how to land. Um, so that's the big difference that the rovers are controlled from Earth generally because the time delay lets them do that. But the drone won't be controlled from Earth. It'll control itself from Mars. Oh, great. This is so interesting. Uh, uh, quite a relevant question then. If um, it, This is from R. Whittle, I believe. If people could get to Mars, could we live there? I'm very happy with that. I, I, would, I would love to go to Mars. Um, I mean, I suppose, the, yes, we can send people to Mars and yes, humans can live on Mars. But remember, Mars is very cold. And remember, it doesn't have much air to breathe. Well, it doesn't have any air that we can breathe. So if you do go to Mars, you're going to have to either stay inside your house and have your own air and have your own heating inside your house. Um, or if you do go out, then you would have to wear some sort of spacesuit. Um, and I should say, this isn't actually my spacesuit. I haven't, I haven't been to space. I, I want to go to space, but can I say thanks to the Science Centre Network who've lent me this suit, which is one of the ones, it's a model of the one Tim Peake would have worn when he went up. So, uh, so yes, we can send people to Mars. They can live on Mars, um, but it might not be the nicest place to live. I don't know, would you go to Mars? Pretty cold, nowhere to breathe, but you'd be the first human on Mars. I'd quite like to go to Mars if I could come back again. I'm not sure I'd like to live there forever. <laughs> um, a quick question from Ace Nursery School. How many Earths fit into the sun? Does anybody know off the top of their head or shall I uh, jump in? <laughs> I don't know, but I, you might have to correct me. I think it's a lot. I think, is it, is it 1 million? 1.3? <sighs> 1. Yeah, over a million, which is crazy, isn't it? Absolutely crazy. I've got a question from year two. Sorry, Sheila. Um, oh, yeah, no, go for it. <laughs> I just have so many questions. Um, and we'll come to a couple of audio questions in a moment. Um, Shetland link up, uh, we'll, we'll come to you next. Um, but year two at St. Mark's would like to know, and I'd actually like to know, what is inside the moon? <laughs> That's, yeah, that's a good question, then. isn't it? <laughs> well, inside the I suppose the moon is is a bit like the Earth. The moon is made of rock. So if you could cut the moon in half, um, you would see rock. Now, on Earth, it's pretty hot uh, inside the Earth. So that rock is molten. It's like lava. And we call it magma. And then in the centre of the Earth, we have a solid core, mostly made of metal called iron. Um, now, I don't know exactly, but I imagine the moon would be similar. Now, the moon is a bit colder than Earth, and it certainly doesn't have as much magma, so it's not as liquid. But I bet towards the middle of the moon, I bet it does have a sort of a liquidy bit um, and probably a solid iron core. So I'm, I'm going to guess, and I might go to Sheila for a more accurate answer, but I'm going to guess it's similar to the Earth with different layers. 
Oh, yeah, sorry, I thought it was muted then. Um, yeah, I totally agree. I think it's got the layers, sort of the crust mantle, inner core, outer core, very similar to the earth, but obviously a lot smaller and slightly different conditions. I've just put in the, the chat to everybody that we are due to finish one minute ago, but there are so many exciting questions. If you wanted to stay on for another five minutes, I wonder if Ben and Rhiannon um, and Sheila, we could all stay on for another five minutes just to do a couple more questions. And then I don't know, but Ben, Rhiannon, I mean, I, I don't know if your organizations might be able to answer any burning questions offline, but if that's the case, and we can always put your uh, email address in the chat so people can uh, get in touch with you directly and ask you any other questions after the, the session is over. Oh, we'd be absolutely but delighted. So from Explorodome's point of view, you know, if people want to get in touch, um, there's Facebook, there's Twitter at Explorodome, and we're, we're always happy any questions about space, they can always contact Explorer Dome. And, uh, and yeah, we're happy to give any answers. Mm. Right, so let's go. Thank you very much. And Rhiannon too, I, I saw the thumbs up. <laughs> um, thank you. So Shetland link up. Um, I do not know what your question is, but hopefully you should be unmuted if you'd like to ask it. Say hello. Hello. Got a little shy voice here. We're actually a home educating family and we've got one wee one who's six who's been watching the show and I think, have you enjoyed it, Joe? He's nodding yeah. his head. Oh, enjoyed brilliant. It. I'm so glad. Yeah. Did you do all the actions? He did most of the actions. He was also eating a snack at the same time, so he couldn't do them all, but he did most of the actions. Safety first. Safety first. Yeah. <laughs> it was really good, though. Thank you. Did you want to ask a particular question that you'd like to ask um, for your group? Well, I tell you what, if you'd like to uh, write us a question in the Q&A, if it's easier than answering, um, asking when your voice is on the screen, let's move instead uh, to Cameron and Grace. So Cameron and Grace, uh, you've asked the question already, which was really good, and you've had your hands up for a while. So, um, can we hear Cameron and Grace to ask your question? Um, how far away is Mars? Good question. It how depends. Far away is it? Yeah, this is this is why we're we're sending spaceships to Mars at the moment because. We said that Earth goes round the Sun, and we've said that Mars goes round the Sun, but that means sometimes Earth and Mars might be on opposite sides of the Sun, and so they might be maybe 400 million kilometres <laughs> apart. Um, but at the moment, the reason Mars looks really good at the moment is Mars and Earth are relatively close. Um, now, I'm going to look to the others for clarification. I think it, when we're closest, we're about 50 million kilometres apart. Mm. I'm getting correction, 85? 55. 55, any advance on 55? <laughs> We've got a, someone in the background going, feeding you correction. Going 55 million miles away uh, at the moment. Kilometers. Kilometers. <laughs> 55 million kilometers. <laughs> I love the question because it's clearly got the experts not knowing. Isn't that, I, I always forget that it, it, it varies. It could be so far away on the other side of the sun. But right now it is really quite close. The closest um, that it's going to be in quite a while. So uh, that's why it looks so good in the night sky as well. So thank you for that answer. Um, right, do we have time for one more question before we finish? Sheila, it's your choice. Well, I was gonna say, um, Sebastian Miles, you've had your hand up for a long time. Let's see if we can get you to ask your question. And that will have to be the last question of the, of the session. Over to you. Can you hear me? Huh? We can! Yay! Um, how many Marses can you fit on Earth? <laughs> hmm. Well, Mars is smaller than Earth. How many yeah. Marses could you fit on Earth? I'm going to guess it. I don't know the answer. I'm going to guess... Seven! <laughs> I know in terms of fruit, if you've got a cherry tomato as Earth, and Mars would be about the size of a blueberry. So it, you know, it's about just under half, maybe just under half the size of the earth. But um, you can let us know if you want, you can find out and then let us know. You, you know, it's great to teach us stuff too. And yeah, then... hopefully that's answered as many questions as we could. It was so great hearing your voices as well. Uh, brilliant for those of you who are are brave enough to ask your own questions. And obviously for, for those of you who aren't able to ask them um, 
with your voice and hopefully we got to many of them. I've put in the chat uh, an email address you could just send your your uh, questions to info at explorerdome.co.uk and I believe that um, Rhiannon can put an email address in there as well or you can look them up on Facebook and ask us live even ask National Astronomy Week live if you go onto Twitter. Um, but for now, we are going to finish our session. Thank you so much to everyone joining us from all parts of the UK and possibly even overseas. Um, tomorrow, at the same time, 11 o'clock, we're going to be looking at robots on Mars, which is very exciting. And the day after, it's all about what kind of space scientist could you be? So we're thinking all about what possible careers you might have um, in space. And obviously all of our friends here, Sheila, Ben and Rhiannon are all people who have careers in the space and astronomy industry. So let's see what you could be when you grow up. For the meantime, though, thank you all very much. And uh, we'll give a big wave goodbye. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.